Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to worship with you this morning. But I really want to thank you even more for the prayers that you have sent my way over the years. I have learned the, the truth of the passage of Scripture that says the prayers of a righteous man have a great deal of power in their effect. For I believe that today I am here and alive because of the prayers of people like you. You have sustained me and moved the arm of God through your prayers. Thank you. Thank you. My sermon today is on the doctrine of suffering. Now it does not deal with the particulars of my suffering it, or your suffering. And that is because we are all created uniquely. And I do not know the depths of your suffering, nor do you know the depths of my suffering. The sermon has to do with what the Bible says about suffering and how the Bible answers questions about suffering. You know the kind of questions we ask. Why me, Lord? Or... What have I done to deserve this? I know one time I was in a deep, bad mood, having a real pity party. And I used both of those in one sentence. Why me, Lord? What have I done to deserve this? I think all of you have been there. But there is another more general question. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people. Well, suffering is a doctrine that is not easy to deal with. Yet each one of us deals with the fact of suffering many times in our life. And God thought it was such an important subject that He included in the Bible an entire book on the subject of suffering. And that's the book of Job. Today, I want us to answer two basic questions. The first one is, what is the source and the purpose of suffering in our lives? And the second, second question is, when we are in the midst of suffering, how are we as Christians to respond? Well, Job, who is our example of suffering, is introduced in the first chapter of his book. He's described as a righteous man and a man who always tried to do what was right, tried to teach his children to do what was right, and was also described as the most wealthy man in the region. Well, Job, after he's introduced in this first portion of the first chapter, the scene shifts to heaven. And there is a, a meeting of the angels and God sees Satan and goes over and asks him, Satan, what have you been doing? And Satan says, oh, I've been going back and forth on the earth. And you know, the Bible tells us that Satan is our adversary. And if he roams around seeking whom he may devour. And therefore, I think it is safe to assume that Satan was on a little trip across the face of the earth to find those he could turn away from God and those whom he could take away their close fellowship with God. God asked Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, who is a righteous man? Satan replies, He's only faithful because you bless him and everything he does. Remove his blessings and he will curse you to your face. Well, God turned Satan loose on Job to bring suffering. But he warned Satan, do not touch Job himself. And in one day, one terrible day. All of Job's children were killed. Most of his servants were killed. 
and all of his cattle were killed or stolen. And Job responds to this great calamity with these words. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Scripture says he did not sin, nor did he blame God. And that's important to remember. He did not blame God for what had happened to him. In another meeting in heaven, God sees Satan and asks him what he's been doing. And he says, I've been going to and fro over the face of the earth. And God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? Job, uh, Satan says, Job only remained faithful to you because you have not touched him personally. So God gives Satan the, the right to bring personal suffering to Job. But he says, do not kill him. Well, immediately Job broke out with terrible, terrible boils from the top of his feet, I mean top of his head, to the bottom of his feet. And the scripture says, Job did not blame God. In both these times, it, Job did not blame God. Remember that. A couple of things we need to observe in Job's experience. First, God does not send suffering as punishment for our sins. When we accept Christ as our Savior, He forgives all of our sins. And He does not punish us for that which we have already been forgiven. So do not blame God for your suffering. It all comes from Satan. The second thing we uh, must learn from this encounter is that Satan uses the things of this world to get into our lives and his purpose is to bring suffering so that we blame God, that he can separate us from the close fellowship of, with God and that he can ruin our testimony. Remember, Satan is out there prowling around like a lion seeking someone he may devour. So I think it's very important that we understand the different ways in which Satan can bring suffering into our lives. And he does it through this world, just as he did with Job. In Romans 8.35 gives us a beautiful outline of how Satan uses the world to cause us to doubt God. Paul says, Who or what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? Here are seven different ways that Satan comes at us from the world. And I went to my Greek textbooks to make sure that I had accurate definitions of these words so we could understand how Satan might be coming at us. Well, the first is tribulation. Tribulation is suffering from outside pressures on our lives. An illustration of that is while Paul was in Lystra preaching the gospel, the people of Lystra opposed him. They stoned him. They drug him out of the city and left him by the road thinking he was dead. But Paul was not dead. And he revived. And you know what he did? He walked right back into the city. Tribulation can come to us from in many fashions and forms, but it is always trying to box us in, to keep us quiet, to keep us from telling our testimony of how good God is to us. Distress 
is when you are restricted or limited. In the 16th chapter of Acts, Paul wanted to go to Asia and Bithynia, but he was stopped by the Holy Spirit. When you feel like you know what you should do and what God wants you to do, and it is blocked, that is distressing. Years ago, a man uh, blocked me from doing what I felt God wanted me to do and what I desperately wanted to do. And folks, there was distress in that. Years later, I realized God's Spirit was involved in the whole thing and that He was working things out for my good. The third word is persecution. And it means that you are suffering because of your faith, because of your faithfulness, because of your values. I never thought I would see a day when in this country churches and Christians would be persecuted. But in this woke country, you can be canceled because you do not believe or act like some other group. Now, don't ask me what woke and canceled means. I'm too old to understand that kind of stuff. But I do know that today the church, our Christian beliefs, and our Christian values are under attack in our country. And that is persecution. The fourth way Satan gets at us through the world is through famine. Famine is simply suffering due to a natural disaster. Living here on the Gulf Coast, I don't think I need to explain that to you much. We've seen a lot of it. And you understand from experience, from the experience of some of your friends, from the experience of those folks who live east of Panama City, they understand what famine is when a storm takes everything away. Another way Satan causes us to suffer is through nakedness. Now, not many of you are going to be homeless and have to depend upon others for your food, your clothing, your shelter. But brother, I want you to understand that is suffering. And sometimes it is even caused by natural disaster, which we have observed. The next word is danger. I like this one. Have you ever done something careless and have to live to pay for it? That's what the word danger means. We caused it. And now we have to pay the consequences of our actions. And folks, that is never pleasant. It is suffering. The sword is the last word that describes how Satan can get into our lives through the world. The sword basically means the unfair treatment by the governing authorities. You know, I had a good friend who was a meticulous businessman, and yet the IRS audited him seven years in a row, even though they never found him to be out of balance by a single penny. The stress that he went through, the time, the money he had to spend to defend himself, all of these was suffering. You see, Satan tries to separate us from the love of God and a close fellowship with Him through tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, or any combination of these. His aim is to create a distance between ourselves and God. But now the real question, the most important question, is why would God allow all this suffering to the, come into the lives of His children those who, are, who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Well, 
in my study of Scripture, I found seven reasons, or several reasons, why He allows this to happen. Sometimes our suffering is in order to glorify God. God wants His children to show the world the peace we have, even in the midst of the most stormy times of our lives. Our faithfulness will draw others to Him. John 11.4 tells us that when Jesus heard about the death of Lazarus, He said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It may be that at some time in your life you have suffered for the glory of God. As those out there in the world wanted to know whether Jesus made a difference and they watched you in your suffering and you were able to show them the difference God makes. I'll never forget the day my doctor said to me, Herschel, there is no medical reason and there is no clinical explanation for how well you're doing. It must be divine intervention. How humbling it is that God would take something happening in our life and glorify Himself. To God be the glory. But you know, there is also suffering unto death. I remember a wonderful, wonderful saint of God who blessed the church that I was pastoring. She discovered her spiritual gifts and used them to minister in the church to just about everybody. The church loved her. And then... She was struck with brain cancer. As her pastor, I stood beside her bed, held her hand, trying to bring some comfort. And she said, Herschel, I had wanted to live long enough to see my new grandson grow up. And then in sobs, she cried out, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. The whole church was in mourning. And two weeks after her funeral, her husband moved in with his secretary. I remembered Isaiah 57 one and two, where it says the righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. They, that is, they don't think about it. What is the big picture here? What is God doing in all of this in the world and in my life? Devout men are taken away while no one understands. We just don't understand what God is doing in the world and in our own lives so often. Our our finite minds cannot comprehend it. He goes on to say, For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. My good friend was delivered from the embarrassment, the shame, the self-doubt that surely would have come from an unfaithful husband. And she was ushered into God's peace. Remember, Psalm 115, verse 16, tells us precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Sometimes in our suffering and the suffering of others around us, we need to step back and meditate on what's happening and say, God, help me understand what you are doing in this world and in me. I don't understand. Please help me. Another reason God allows suffering in our lives is so that we might be matured as Christians. 
James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. <laughs> That's easy to say but hard to do, isn't it? Rejoice in suffering? Wow. We can only do that if we know for sure that God loves us and that He is working, us, working in us to make us His mature children. For James continues, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, every time your faith has been challenged, it has grown stronger, stead more steadfast than ever before. He is working in us to make us mature children of God. Therefore, he completes the passage by saying, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, the word perfect simply means that you have everything you need to do God's work in a sinful world. God allows suffering in our lives in order that we may grow much more like Jesus and more useful in God's kingdom. The last reason that I found for God allowing suffering in our lives seemed a little bit strange when I first read it. It's found in Colossians 1.24. And you have to read it carefully, so listen carefully. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is the church. Do not misunderstand what Paul is saying here. He is not saying that Christ's afflictions are insufficient for your salvation, for the blood of Christ covers all your sins. But the church needs continuous examples of righteous, faithful, joyful suffering. That the, and that kind of an example in our lives will draw people to Christ. So let us be faithful in our suffering. Let us take up our cross and follow Jesus with a glad heart. Satan uses suffering to distance us in our relationship with God, but God allows suffering in our lives for a number of reasons, but always for our benefit. So as Christians, when these sufferings come upon us, how are we to respond? This is the application of my message today. The next time you find yourself in a suffering time of life, how are you going to respond? Well, Job set the example. When everyone was telling him that he was suffering because he had made some great big sin and God was punishing him for that sin. Then his wife came to him and says, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Whew, sweet woman, right? Job's answer to his wife and friends comes in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. And I am amazed at how clearly Job sees through the mist of time to the end days, to when Jesus is coming back, that great getting up morning. He says, For I know, I know that my Redeemer lived. And I know that Jesus lives. He is alive today. And he's coming back. And he says at last, he will stand upon the earth. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. 
And Job continues. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job sees through the mists of time the day that Jesus is coming back for all of those who have believed in Him as His Savior, who have trusted God with their lives, and He's going to come back on this earth, raise us from the dead, give us a new body, that we might have a forever body for a forever relationship with Him. Wow! What a proclamation of faith in the midst of suffering. His other response is found in Job 27, beginning with verse 2. Now remember, everybody is telling him that he's suffering because he's such a big sinner. That he has a big sin in his life that's being punished by God. And he says, Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast to my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. In other words, I don't care what you think about me or what it looks like in my circumstances. I will hold on to my integrity. I will do what is right until the day I die. 1 Peter 4.19 simplifies that message into one sentence. He says, Therefore let those of you who suffer according to God's will entrust their soul to a faithful Creator while doing Good. When the world seems about to overwhelm you, trust God. Trust God. He loves you and wants what is best for you no matter what the circumstances might be. Trust Him with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength. And then do what is right. As a Christian, that is how you ought to respond in an evil world who's watching you and who wants to know, does Jesus really make a difference? As you go through your suffering, you will be able to demonstrate your faith because you know the truth of Romans 8.28 that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Yes, all things work together for good. All things. He's not leaving anything out. Not even your worst suffering. All things work out for good for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. But I want you to understand that statement does not include those who have never received Jesus as their Savior. Most of the promises and blessings of the Bible are for the children of God, those who already have a relationship with Him. Now for those of you who have never accepted Jesus as your Savior, that's bad news. But the good news is that you can change your relationship with God today. You can receive the fruits of His promises right now. You can admit that you are a sinner. And that simply means that you're admitting to yourself and God that you've done some things that you knew were wrong, but you did them anyway. Next, you need to trust that Jesus took upon Himself the penalty of your sins, so that by faith those sins may be erased forever and that you may have a forever life with Him today. 
You can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. My question is, will you? Will you today receive Christ as your Lord? Let us pray. Father, thank you for the promises of your word to we, your children. Thank you that you are at work in this world and in our lives to bring good to us and not harm. Thank you, God, for loving us and blessing us even in the midst of our sufferings. And I pray today for those who are here who have never accepted Christ as their Savior. I hope your Holy Spirit, or I pray that your Holy Spirit, will touch their heart today, will help them see their need, and that they will invite Jesus to be their Savior and Lord, that they they may know what it's like to be a friend of God now and forever and ever. Amen.